Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for tuning in to my talk. I am Odeme Bochkute, uh, archaeology PhD student at the University of Glasgow. And today I will be sharing some results from a Scottish Mesolithic uh, vegetation reconstruction and talk about a few ways I found it useful to think about landscape. Uh, even if you're not interested in the Mesolithic, I hope you will find some relevance in some aspects of this approach. Um, this work is part of a paleo environment chapter in my PhD thesis on the Mesolithic of the Isle of Arran in Scotland. Uh, in this talk, I will be addressing one of the major issues I identify in this re research area, which is presenting Mesolithic archaeological sites that are non-monumental, therefore often invisible in the modern landscape, situated at unengaging developed locations. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is blurring the boundary between people, land and water uh, and demonstrating the significance of the wider environment in our accounts of the past that can be relevant in the present. So the nature of Mesolithic evidence in Scotland more broadly and on Arran specifically is generally invisible in the modern landscape. Most sites are discovered thanks to the work of local evocational collectors, research and rescue or commercial excavations, therefore are in developed areas. Um, this landscape reflects uh, the Mesolithic of Arran rather well. Uh, this, the, uh, this part of the island, Macrimore, uh, is known for its Neolithic stone circles. However, this landscape is also significant for the Mesolithic. Uh, Balnagore Farm, for example, is a large Mesolithic lithic scatter discovered by a local evocational archaeologist, Fiona Gorman. Uh, the site is situated along Macri River in a farm field used for sheep grazing. That's the expanded one. Um, also, here is Macri, Moore, uh, Macri North site, a small lithic scatter that was discovered uh, during a test pitting survey as part of a rescue excavation in an area that was designated for forestry planting. Uh, it currently sits along Mapley Burn in a conifer plantation. Um, essentially, these sites are not places where you would go to visit to engage with the Mesolithic. You would be standing in a farm field for the most part, uh, looking out to other farm fields and trying to ignore how awful the patchy shave looks on the hills of forestry plantations. Uh, it is difficult to activate those archaeologists' eyes to imagine what the landscape vegetation would have been like. But what landscape do we tend to imagine and what informs it? Um, plant use, plant perception, um, woodland management strategies are rather hot topics in Mesolithic research. Um, this is fascinating and valuable work, but the focus is largely on selected contents of the landscape represented by the archaeological evidence. Um, the landscape as a whole lacks texture and we usually just ignore the modern landscape to concentrate on the site specifically. Uh, landscape vegetation becomes this non-specific background and resource base, very much like a fog of war concept type video game. Uh, but escape approach insists on the importance of the totality. Uh, Fraser Stewart argues that a greater understanding of the texture of environment uh, the totality of our biophysical surroundings is a crucial part uh, of constructing meanif meaningful accounts of the past uh, life. Uh, trees, plants, um, animals, rivers, sea, and our relationships with them all play an important part in shaping uh, how we live and who we are. Uh, John Evans terms this a uh, textured approach to, to the past. Uh, people's lives in the landscape do not end at the boundary determined by archaeological sites. The woodlands have an impact on space that creates a place-specific dynamic between people and the land. Uh, and the nature of this relationship would be determined or enabled by the specific context people inhabit. Uh, so to get at this, we need more specific landscape information. So how did the primeval woodland look like? Uh, there is a general debate between two opposing views. The traditional view, i.e. Peter Ken's natural woodland book, says forests were naturally dense, whereas Vera's hypothesis uh, says that uh, forests were open because of grazing animals. Uh, Whitehouse and Smith, 
think that grazing was not a factor contributing to landscape openness in the Mesolithic, but instead is associated with the Neolithic period onwards uh, with domesticated animals. Uh, Svenning suggests impact of fire, flooding, and low soil fertility, uh, edaphic and topographic conditions, um, uh, windthrow and perhaps localized herbivore activity at particular habitats, creating openings in an otherwise closed forest. And Mitchell points out that understanding primeval forests is important because woodland conservation policy in Europe seeks to recreate them. Uh, so current policy, policy promotes closed canopy deciduous forest, but this would be wrong if the primeval forest was actually more open. Um, all of this doesn't determine things for Aaron specifically, but clearly landscape openness is important. Um, so what was the vegetation cover like on Aaron uh, during the Mesolithic and how can I get at this? Luckily, I found out about the multiple scenario approach or MSA. Uh, MSA is a method for quantitative reconstruction of past vegetation from pollen records. Uh, it produces land cover maps of past vegetation distribution as spatial simulations of pollen assemblages. Uh, the MSA was created by Dr. Jane Bunting and Richard Middleton, and it's um, described and applied in the following publications I listed here. Um, I also briefly summarized the process and included a list of basic data required for an overview, but I won't be going, go, going over this uh, for the sake of time. Um, this approach demonstrates the potential of reusing old data sets to generate new knowledge. I had access to two available pollen diagrams from the island that overall represented different parts of the island landscape, so the northern highlands and southern lowlands. Um, unfortunately, uh, the earliest part of the Mesolithic was not represented in either pollen diagram, so the chronology starts at 7500 BC. Uh, in a new age depth model, um, time depth was divided into 500 year time windows with pollen samples averaged for each. So vegetation change is in fact smoothed over a coarse chronological resolution, but this is what the available pollen diagrams um, allowed for. In addition to geological and geographic data uh, that represents the physical landscape in a GIS, uh, you need to encode vegetation placement. Uh, these are landscape rules or vegetation restrictions based on local and general plant ecology knowledge. Uh, for this, I consulted local vegetation surveys and plant community ecology literature. Um, encoded uh, ecological rules are largely simplified and not too restrictive. It is best not to overdetermine vegetation restrictions uh, to get optimal results. Um, as with any computer modeling, simulations are not recreations of past reality. Interpretation does not end with it. Uh, I do not think that a past environment can ever be reconstructed objectively in a computer simulation because space and time are never fixed. Uh, but nor do I dismiss the usefulness of GIS as a conceptual tool to communicate spatial knowledge. Uh, all input data is based on modern observations of vegetation and ecology is complex and difficult to quantify. Uh, there's always a chance that these things were different in the past. Um, but obviously results are limited to the available pollen data and pixel size is also a consideration when setting out landscape rules. Um, MSA can be used to test pollen modeling um, or inform further palynological fieldwork, but I think it can also inform local land cover for better site presentation and wider landscape contextualization. It also led me to think about Mesolithic landscape in a new way. Uh, I found it to be a great heuristic device. So these are the selected best fit maps for each time slice. Uh, overall, this produced good results, uh, good statistical results. Uh, so it is a potential vegetation reconstruction based on all the parameters that went into creating it. Uh, regarding land cover, uh, hazel and birch dominate the deciduous woodland with a sprinkle of oak and pine and elm. Uh, riparian uh, wetland trees sit in river floodplains and wetlands that are very characteristic as well. Um, in all periods, uh, tree cover is under 50%, suggesting the canopy must have been open. Uh, this is contested. Uh, consistent with the fact that oak, birch, hazel, and pine are light demanding trees that require a degree of openness for regeneration. 
Um, hazel is the dominant canopy tree, 12 to 20% of the entire land cover. So the Mesolithic continues to be synonymous with hazels. Um, let me give an example um, case study of how um, the MSA helped me change the way I see a landscape. Uh, we're back at Macri for this one. Um, in the present landscape, we see Macri Bay and tidal shoreline, uh, non-native species in forestry plantations, field divisions and irrigated farm fields, pockets of native woodland um, along the rivers, um, but generally moorlands and bare mountains in the distance. Uh, and the stars here are the two invisible Mesolithic, site, uh, Mesolithic sites in this landscape. Uh, so comparing results between modern and past land cover, um, flat terrain and sea level rise meant that uh, the current inland is coastal and the tides are blurring that conceptual boundary between sea and land emphasized by uh, changeable vegetation ecozones. Um, the Mesolithic place of Balnabor becomes coastal, uh, situated on the dry, wet margin, where open sea, tidal beaches, rivers, mire, and riparian and deciduous woodland meet. It's a place of dynamic land and sea. Um, similar pat uh, patterns seen in other parts of the island with multi-period sites of later Mesolithic and Neolithic archaeology. Um, so we see that people are choosing to live at such dynamic locations. They are not marginalized by the woodlands, but their choice of place is better understood to incorporate other aspects of location, including shorelines, rivers that are and rivers that are just as significant as woodlands. Uh, and just to point out uh, another part of this landscape, um, this is where you you now have irrigation, this open peatland, a modern landscape that conceals a land sea dynamic of the deep past. This drained land now hides a deep history of environmental change with shifting sea levels uh, in this lowland coastal valley that transformed the vegetation. Um, and now this is farmland, um, peat fields, what was in the past, ocean and salt marshes in tidal, tidal lowlands with alder car, sedge mires and reed swamps. Um, this was a dynamic sea landscape, um, textured and rhythmical, uh, not a background, but relational and agential. Uh, even in a study of woodlands, the long-term view insists on not separating land from water. Uh, tidal cycles and sea level rise can significantly transform landscape vegetation and its biodiversity. Uh, MSA maps help define that vegetation scape. It is beneficial to develop a better understanding of vegetation diversity and imagine the Mesolithic Aran landscape more in focus. Uh, this aspect of the landscape is no longer totalized as an undif undifferentiated background or bare topography. Uh, although the simulations are not representations of past reality, they are mere suggestions and many ecological assumptions may be wrong. Uh, it highlights the potential to weave together different standards of evidence and new methods that, that, that can stimulate new thinking about space uh, and time. Um, are the native woodlands at all representative of the Mesolithic woodland? Um, well, there are likely no modern analogues for the Mesolithic woodland, and any of these suggestions are likely wrong, keeping in mind uh, woodland histories and management. Um, I am a fan of not leaving uh, the archaeology of the past to the past. Um, can there be a way to apply these results? Uh, could we engage with the eventuality of environmental change and landscape transformation, uh, land sea interrelationality and non-human forces in past environments that can be relevant for the future? Um, this can be an avenue for critical engagement with archaeology in the landscape that usually tends to focus on the dynamic cultural against a static natural background. Um, native woodlands reflect current uh, concerns of biodiversity and habitat loss. Maybe that's where we go to engage with Mesolithic time. Um, I think that all of time is embedded in the present landscape. Through archaeology, we see that people lived with the same but different landscape. Uh, they were part of it and not separate from it, just as people are now. Um, woodland conservation work is very lively on the island. 
uh, iron footpaths and forestry, uh, forestry plant thousands of trees, iron forest and NTS volunteers uh, are restoring native uh, woodlands in Glen Rossa. Um, from an archaeological perspective, rewilding does not need to exclude people, but change their relationship to what is be deemed to be the wild. Uh, there is no need to romanticize times lost, but indeed change the landscape for the future, being inspired by the deep past. Um, the red squirrels would definitely appreciate this collaboration and an increase in hazelnuts if we aim for a hazel dominant woodland. Um, I think that imagining a past landscape can in fact relate to imagining a different one in the future. So thank you for listening. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, um, Dr. Jean Bunting for all her, her help learning the MSA. Uh, here's the list of relevant and mentioned literature and I welcome any questions, but feel, feel free to uh, contact me by email if you have any um, additional queries.